two speeches by Job that are very, very short, that are responses to the, uh, to the God questions. But we're glad that you're here in this next to last of our sessions on the book of Job. The Lord be with you. And also with you. And let us pray. God of humility and, and patient love, all that has been is now and ever shall be is the result of your creative word. We readily confess that we cannot even begin to understand all that we see, much less appreciate how intricately integrated are those parts of creation we cannot see. Forgive us those times when focusing on one small aspect of your creation, we think we could surely make it work more smoothly than you have. Grant us a more fulsome spirit of humility and a greater appreciation of your loving wisdom, that we may ever rest assured of your providential oversight of our world. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, Stephen is back. His eyes are uh, <laughs> And we have a uh, box solo for this evening. Well, we do. Um, at least I'm wearing glasses, so any wrong notes are attributable to the glasses. Um, I've mentioned before there were six of these box suites, and each one was sort of a collection of dance movements with a prelude at the start. Well, in each of the six suites, kind of in the middle, uh, there are a pair, let's say, of very, very brief movements that have the same name. In the first two suites, for example, they call them Minuet One, Pop call them Minuet One and Minuet Two, very old dances. And the general procedure is to play the first one, play the second one, and then go back and play the first one again. So it makes a kind of a nice rounded three part sort of form. In the third and the fourth suites, there are bourrées. And so that's what I'm playing tonight, are the two bourrées from the third suite. Um, a bourrée is characterized by a kind of a large duple beat, and it's very, very easy to hear. Uh, each of these movements, the bourrée one and then the bourrée two, is divided roughly in half, and each half is repeated. So what you hear is, Half of Bore one, half repeated, the other half of Bore one repeated. Then Bore two changes key in a very obvious way and changes character in a very obvious way. Here, half of Bore two repeated, half the other half of Bore two repeated. It takes longer to say it than to play it almost. And then we go back and play Bore one straight through without any repeat. This is also one movement out of all the six suites, in addition to this one, that one, that uh, might be familiar sometime. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, we're ready for chapter 38, and we'll move through the very first part of chapter 42 of this evening. Well, Job has been calling for God to show his face and to open his mouth and speak to him almost since the time Job first opened his mouth, way back in chapter 3. Suddenly, in the midst of a storm that uh, perhaps they saw beginning to come their direction in the last chapter, uh, God will now begin to speak to, to Job, and it is a surprise not only to Job, but it's we can read between the lines and see that it's a surprise to all of the other persons who are gathered around there as well, and may even be a surprise to us also. Just a couple of introductory comments about uh, these speeches, and then we'll jump right into the text. Um, despite God showing up in the storm, which is often linked with angry gods, God is not angry in these chapters. God is, is rather more... Um, showing up as a teacher, willing to instruct Job on the right ways to think and, and the right ways uh, to speak. So he's instructing rather than uh, pontificating to or against uh, Job. The speeches are deadly serious, but they're also somewhat humorous. And maybe even a bit, you'll pick up on it, I'm sure, if you read carefully through the text, almost even a bit sarcastic if you're willing to let God be sarcastic towards you. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, one last sort of introductory comment. Um, it's also going to be clear, if you kind of step back from all the things that God says, by the time we get to the first part of chapter 42, it becomes kind of clear that God's people, all people, we have a tendency to um, uh, get, get bent out of shape, all bent out of shape, trying to fix the tiny little piece of the cosmos that we think we understand, only to mess everything up way worse because we don't understand how that little piece fits into the big equation. Brian could probably talk at some length about this, but, but you know, just one thing off the top of my head that becomes readily clear, having lived in the South for you know, 35 years, is, is there's kudzu everywhere. Well, you know, how in the world we introduced kudzu we're never going to get rid of it. <laughs> but there it is, and we've got to deal with it now. And, and that's just one of thousands of examples that could be given of what we thought we understood and then did has only made matters much worse. And if Job had had the opportunity to do what he thought he wanted to do, it would have made matters much worse than, than not being able to do so. So with that, let's jump into the, the text itself. Um, I guess I shouldn't get to that first. Um, there's about three verses in the first part of, of chapter 38 in which God sort of introduces uh, what he's going to do and say to Job before he actually gets into the actual speech part itself. So he shows up in the midst of a storm. A storm is, if you've read any theological stuff, this is the numinous. This is um, the holy other showing up and speaking to, to Job. It's worship. God shows up in the midst of worship, and it, if, it, if you will, it scares Job to death. He doesn't know what to, to think about God actually showing up in the midst of a, a worship service. He has, Job has been calling on God, as I said, almost since chapter 3, but in this particular episode, it is not Job calling on God, it is God calling on Job. A complete reversal, and of course, you know, one of the things that's often said about the Christian faith is that we have really the only religion in the world in which it is not human beings needing to find God, it is God coming to us. It is a radical reversal of everything we've always thought. We don't have to find God. God, God comes to us. So, you know, I mean, if, if you don't quite get why this would be an issue to Job, just think how you would feel, how you would respond if you've shown up for worship and about the time worship begins, God starts talking to you um, and addressing your situation. What would you do? Well, that just throws a whole kink in what worship's all about, didn't it? <laughs> if God actually were to show up, well, that's what Job's having to deal with in this chapter. So we can, you know, we can give Job a lot of sympathy in the midst of these chapters as he's having to listen to uh, God speak to him because we would feel exactly the same way if not a whole lot worse. Job, Job has been questioning God's justice for 
chapter after chapter after chapter, and God is going to essentially declare that Job doesn't have a clue Amen. as to what justice really is, much less how this fits into the big picture. And so God is going to have to instruct him as to how all this works together. Um, and as I said, up to this point in time, Job has been questioning God. But in the midst of these two speeches that are going to cover these chapters, God is beginning to question Job. And that's going to feel very different, not only for Job, but for us as well. You know, we, we ask questions of the Bible all the time. We, have, we make demands on God all the time. Uh, but one of the things about Scripture when you begin to study it is you realize that, well, those may be important, those questions that I ask of God, but in the midst of that text and in the midst of our worship, God is always asking questions of me. God is always making demands on me as well. And those are much more important in the long run than any of the questions I bring to the text or that I bring to God. Uh, so, um, in the King James Version, this is where God tells Job, gird up your loins. We're off to the races now. Uh, get yourself ready. Have a seat, uh, because we're, you're going to listen for a while. Then. So, so there we are as we jump in then uh, to verse 4 in uh, chapter uh, 38. Now, there really is some, some good order uh, to chapters 38 and, and 39. Um, God's going to talk first of all about kind of the structure of the world, and then he's going to talk about his providence toward the world, how God maintains the world. So the first part is kind of creating the world and then maintaining the world. And all of this is built around these questions that God continues to, to ask of Job. Um, so where God starts with Job is he tells him that despite his desire to actually do so, Job really does not have the wisdom. He's not smart enough to really be able to critique God, though he has thought he has enough wisdom. God lets him know on the front end that he does not have the wisdom necessary uh, to actually critique God. And, and the reason is because Job hasn't been around long enough. He doesn't have the insight. Uh, to be able to see the big picture. He was not there when God formed the world. He wasn't there to help God create the blueprints of the world. He wasn't there when God began to work from the blueprints to the actual creation <coughs> of the world. And you would think, you know, when you sit down and actually reflect on it, you'd think, well, you probably would need to have that kind of insight to be able to then start talking about how God's actually dealing with things in the world. God will then back off for a moment and talk of some specifics of, of the things that God has created. Um, for instance, like the sea. And by the sea, that's not just the, the waters uh, on you know, the oceans, for instance, but it's also the waters in the sky. Um, and, and in an interesting twist, God talks about these waters wrapping them up in swaddling clothes. The seas and, and the skies and everything, they are like infants to God. They depend upon, as, as terrible as they can sometimes be, they depend on God just as an infant depends on its parents, those who have created him or her. Well, and, and Job, uh, through a series of questions, God makes it clear to Job that he doesn't know where the lights in the morning come from, or how to create the lights in the morning, much less the darkness at night. He doesn't know where the darkness actually resides. He's never, he's never been there. Uh, Job's never been to the fonts of the ocean. He's never been to the gates of Sheol. How on earth can he talk about such things if he's never actually been there and, and seen any of them? He doesn't have any realistic clue about any of the intricacies of, of the earth on which we live. Uh, and in, when you finally get down to verse 18, God actually pauses and says, you're not going to respond to me? You've been making comments now for how many chapters? Are you not going to respond to what I've just said to you? Are you going to claim, as you have been claiming, that, that you actually do have wisdom? Job's response is to wisely keep his mouth shut. In this point. He doesn't say a word. He just just sits there and takes it. So God continues talking in, in verse 19. He says, you know, Job, you've never journeyed far enough east to see where, where 
the morning comes from. I've never journeyed far enough to the west to see where the, the night uh, resides. Um, and, and as a creature, you are not present in anything that I did. You are not that old. There are stories in, in the Old Testament, and certainly in wisdom literature generally, of wisdom being the first of God's created entities, being present with God in the very beginning. And, and so God is effectively saying, Job, you are not wisdom. You are not wisdom, and you do not have wisdom. So, so you need to back off on some of this. In short, in these opening verses up through verse 24, God is saying, I'm the creator, and you're the creature, and you need to remember that. In a sense, Job, of course, has not forgotten it, but in a sense, Job has forgotten it and is moving beyond that. So, so God has to remind him, you are, you are the creature. At that point, God then switches uh, over and begins talking not so much about the creation of, of the universe, of, of the cosmos, but he begins talking about the maintenance the way that God has providentially cared for everything once it was actually created. And here again, he's, he's getting on Job because Job doesn't have the wisdom that he has claimed to have had. And one of the very first things that Job, or that God mentions in this section, and there in verses 25 through 27, as, as a ready example or illustration of the way that God cares for things that most of us wouldn't have ever given a second thought to, God mentions all the barren, arid places of the world where nobody lives, nobody has ever lived, nobody will ever live. And yet God makes sure that rain comes to those areas, that sun comes to those areas, and that they are cared for, even though there will never be, as we might put it, anybody to ever appreciate it. God makes sure that that portion of the universe is cared for, providential. Would you care for those parts like that? Do you care for things that you care nothing at all about? Well, no, of course we don't. But God does. Um, Job has no understanding about any of this. He doesn't understand how, how it happens or where it comes from. Precipitation, the, when, the, when the skies rain, Job doesn't know how to produce rain. He doesn't know how to control rain. He doesn't know where to send rain. But God does this all the time for the world. God sends the rain upon both the just and upon the unjust. And, and if that's not enough, well, then God begins to switch over to interstellar space. Do you, Job, understand how interstellar space interacts with us here on this planet, in this little world that we're in? Well, no, of course you don't, uh, Job. Um, so let's go back and talk about the rainfall again for a little bit. And Job still can't, of course, figure that one out. So, so he switches over to, to um, animals. Let's talk about animals once we get to chapter 39. Can you provide food for lions, Job? Well, no, maybe they've got too large of teeth. Can you provide food for ravens then? Nope, you can't provide food for ravens. Well, can you help the deer and its, its birthing needs? Um, how about the mountain goat? Can you help it have its young when, when it's time? No? Well, how can you provide freedom for the wild donkey? No? Can you? Well, how about the ostrich? Can you protect the ostrich who doesn't seem to have enough sense to actually care for its young when it just produces those eggs and then leaves them be? Uh, well, all right, fine. Can you produce an, Can you create an animal as majestic as the horse? No, you can't do that either. Well, how about birds of prey? Can you command birds of prey how they are to, to fly through the air or where they are to go or guide them on their migratory flights from one place to another? You can't do that either, Joe. Well, okay. Um, what can you do, <laughs> Joe? Um, by the time you get to the end of chapter 39, it is very clear that there is only one Lord in the world, and that is not Job. It is God. So, in the first part of chapter 42, or chapter 40, just those first couple of verses, God will stop for a moment, and I said here an invitation, it's really a demand, 
uh, God will demand that Job respond. He's been sitting there almost with his hand over his mouth. Actually, it hasn't yet been. He's going to put his hand over his mouth in just a moment. But, but God demands that now Job respond. So Job, who has been questioning God repeatedly, is now being questioned by God. And God says, speak up. Tell me, give me an answer to all of these questions that I have been asking you. Are you really my equal? Are you really above me? And Job is going to have to respond to that. We're going to wait just a moment to get to that response. Um, but before I let James come up here and, and comment on my comments, uh, in, your, in your books on page 63, questions 1 and 2, I think do a good job of offering us an opportunity to sort of reflect on um, God's initial comments to Job. So take just a, a minute or two and at least kind of read through and reflect on those questions, and then James will come up and um, discuss the uh, speech as well. At last, after the lengthy speeches of Elihu, which themselves followed the poignant and painful interaction between Job and his friends, the Lord himself now speaks, as Vaughn is alluding to, rebuking Job and asking him how much he knows about God and his world after all. Do you really think that you can lecture me? Yet the Lord's speeches do not focus on issues of justice, nor do they address uh, the problem of suffering, theodicy, like we talked about before. Instead, they extol on uh, the majesty and sovereignty of God, especially in the celestial realm, the points of orderliness, uh, providence of his creation, as we've discussed in various uh, lectures before uh, in this study. And th so things are definitely far from being out of control. And again, just to kind of touch on some of these, if you fast forward to 2021, and I know we've talked about them a little bit, but these are ones that a lot of times I'll, I'll talk about with skeptical groups or, or in a university setting. We'll only go through just a couple of just this, the structure of the world, the maintenance of the world. Today, physicists and cosmologists will actually recognize something uh, like gravity. There's basically 28 cosmological constants, they call them, that have to be at a, at a razor's edge of fine tuning for life to even exist. There's actually 100, but 28 minimum have to be exact. And if we look at just gravity, as far as just the structure of the world, it, it'll kind of give you some sense of this today. And even atheist scientists, I mean, they all recognize this as a fact. They just come to different conclusions. Gravity, which we don't even know what it is, but we just know what it does. If you could picture a ruler stretched across the universe, 13.7 billion light years, in one inch increments, the force of gravity, if it was moved over just one inch on that, 13.7 billion uh, yardstick, uh, life couldn't exist. Gravity would be too much, our cells, everything would crush. If it was just a pinch lighter, we couldn't hold together. And, and again, that's just gravity. So it kind of, if you fast forward the talk and the questions God's asking Job in the 21st century, we're just now starting to scratch the surface of that. Uh, another quick example, cosmological constant, sounds like a fancy word. All it is is the energy, energy density of space. Uh, what's important here is if it was a little bit larger number, uh, stars and galaxies couldn't exist. And if it was just a little bit more positive, uh, the universe would collapse in on itself. 
So just this one, a lot of times I'll have a slide here uh, that'll just kind of show as an illustration. If you picture North America with dimes touching side by side, completely covering all of North America, the United States, Canada, Mexico, and then you went ahead and stacked them high enough to reach to the moon, then multiplied that by a billion, blindfolded Vaughn, painted one of those dimes blue, said pick it. And he randomly was like, I got it. That would be just getting the cosmological constant. So it, it really kind of sheds some light on what Joe here is saying is that uh, without knowing any of this uh, data, the ancients could readily see that the world operated on certain fixed principles. And here the Lord is saying, I set this all up and you really don't have the slightest clue about it. Uh, who was it, Job, that established its dimensions and stretched out a measuring line over it? Tell me if you know. And again, I think if you fast forward to the 21st century, this has become even more apparent, and we're just scratching the surface. So how does Job respond to all of that? Well, um, it won't take long to tell you how he responds. Um, he doesn't recant he doesn't say oh gosh i was was wrong um he just simply says well i'm not taking anything back i said what i said but i'm I, you know, i'm not taking any of it back i just am not going to continue pressing my case any further and so i'm going to put my hand over my mouth to make sure i don't say anything so so you're really not sure at this point if Job is convinced or furious with God, but he's at least not talking. After taking Job on a tour of the heavens, uh, the earth and the animal kingdom uh, in 38 through 39, the Lord challenges him directly, asking him what he has to say in response. Job's answer, I think, is fitting, fittingly humble as he has been put in his proper place before his creator, uh, who rebukes him for declaring God guilty so as to justify himself. God then points Job's attention to another part of his creation, uh, the enigmatic behemoth and Leviathan. And again, more conservative commentators describe this as potentially ancient creatures like dinosaurs. Uh, and I usually anger both the more liberal and the conservative exegetes when I say, I don't know. And uh, if I claim to know absolutely, as both camps often do, it seems like I'm doing exactly what God is rebuking Job for. So I think usually what will happen is uh, we actually have a small exhibit I was telling Vaughn about this in the history museum there at the uh, Eureka Springs, the Great Passion Play, because we have so many people ask, why did dinosaurs fit in the Bible? And uh, we just, usually we show four little clips and say, here's four options. This one could be, you know, was, was dinosaurs on the ark? Was, uh, you know, most of them died from blood? Hey, maybe, yeah, yes. Okay, did they really live 65 million years ago? And it was just completely independent of the Bible? Yeah, I guess that's possible. But instead of saying definitively, yes, this is what it is, uh, and then there's more of a middle approach where uh, A&E hosted by Leonard Nimoy, uh, it was an interesting one. It basically takes the position, yes, 65 million years ago, but some of the dinosaurs did live up until the time of humans. That's where the dragon legends and some of these other things come from. Bottom line is we don't know. And uh, there are certain points like, look now, Behemoth. Eats grass like cattle, his tail is like a cedar tree. Well, you know, you'll see some commentators say, well, that's the elephant. Well, I don't know about the tail being like a cedar tree. What's a hippo? Well, I don't know if that tail is quite like a cedar tree either. So again, you know, I think it's really, uh, you know, just leaning on uh, Michael Brown, who's a Semitic scholar. It seems like he hit the closest to the mark uh, when he says, the overall evidence for behemoth points to an animal known to Job 
by either observation or legend, uh, but of such massive proportion and reputation that it was uh, to personify a primeval chaos monster created by God before the rest of the earth and animals totally under his control. And to the rest, it's really just speculation. Well, now that gets us ready for God's second speech, uh, which will begin in chapter 40, verse 6, and continue through the tail end of, of chapter 41. And it's in this second speech that he will then deal both with Behemoth uh, and, and Leviathan. Um, if the first speech of God told us how we should begin thinking about the world, these, this second speech is going to help us begin to know how we should think about ourselves as well as what we should think about God. So, um, just to jump right on into it then, in chapter 40, uh, verse 8, God comes really just right to the point with Job and says that he has become so fixated uh, over the course of what this book represents. He's become so fixated on his own declarations of personal innocence. I haven't done anything. You, God, have become my enemy. He's become so fixated on that one particular idea that he's reached the point that he's actually beginning to malign God's character in order to make his point. And so God point blank asked Job, are you really sure that you want to press this point? Do you really want to malign my character? If Job really is so wise and discerning as he seems to think uh, that he is, then, you know, you should be able to exercise some just rule in the world if you're that, if you're that wise. Um, and here there's a comment being made about like God's outstretched arm, which is his ability to make things happen in, in particular ways. But if Job is really capable of doing these sorts of things, then he ought to just don the judge's robes and get out there and make judgments. If, if he thinks people have done wrong, then he ought to be done with them. He ought to judge them, and that means kill them. So do that, Job, if you think that you can actually do this. Right the wrong, stop the the uh, wicked, humble the proud. You're capable of doing all of these things. Well, God's touched on a point that really applies to us too. We, we know too many people in the world, and we probably have been guilty from time to time of it ourselves, uh, what a lot of the talking heads in our world do, where they're capable of critiquing what other people are doing. Um, you know, that's easy. It's easy to point out wrongs that other people have done. Um, that doesn't take a lot of smarts. All you have to do is just kind of look. But what does take some energy and some intellect and some wisdom is providing solutions. It's one thing to critique, it's one thing to offer solutions. Job's been critiquing. He's been doing the easy stuff. God says, yeah, we're done with it. If you think you can actually do something, we'll do it. Fix it. You can point it out, so now fix it here. And incidentally, question three on page 63 begins to address this particular aspect. Again, you should at least take a look at it, if not spend some time reflecting on that tonight, tomorrow, the next day. In short, God tells uh, Job that he should since he's so wise, he should actually impose his holy standards on the rest of the world and put all of those wicked in their place. If that means send them to the grave, well then just go ahead and do that, Job. And having accomplished this impressive feat, well then God will be quite happy to let Job take over. Uh, if, he's, if he's really that good, he can do that. But of course, if God's going to let Job take over, if Job is actually capable of doing all this, well then that probably also means that Job could actually deliver himself from the dung heap that he's been sitting on for the last few months all by himself. He really doesn't need God's help after all, do you, Job? Um, so take care of yourself. Fix yourself. Pull, your up, pull yourself up by the bootstraps and, and be done with all of this complaining. 
God is slowly but surely building the case for Job to have to recognize and then fully admit that God is master of many things that Job can't even begin to understand, much less master. But Job has to acknowledge that, and he hasn't quite done that. Uh, and so because Job is not master of all these things, then he has a choice that he's going to have to make. He can, he can continue to press his case against God, which he's been doing, but he'll surely lose. Or he can begin to submit to God's wisdom. That is, recognize that he, in his speaking, he has bumped up against a point where he is almost becoming terribly wrong in what he's thinking about God and he need and he needs to back off and begin to actually trust that God knows what God is doing and is trustworthy and and is capable of doing the things that, that Job has been saying he can't do. Because Job chooses once again not to say anything at this point, God continues to speak. And he offers two examples. He offers the example, first of all, of Behemoth, and then he'll turn to Leviathan. Um, just as kind of an introductory comment, this is, if you will, the greatest, most impressive land creature and the greatest, most impressive sea creature. Uh, so the, the two biggest things that anybody would ever run into. Uh, they are, they are um, mythic, which doesn't mean imaginary, Although we probably have a hard time hearing the word mythic and thinking something other than fantasy. Uh, and so it's, a, it's, prob it's a troublesome to us, which is why there have been many scholars who said, well, Behemoth is the hippopotamus, uh, and Leviathan is the crocodile. Well, okay, I mean, that at some level kind of works, but the way God is describing Behemoth and Leviathan, they seem to be much, much greater than hippopotamus and a crocodile. And so I'm willing to say that they are not intended to be actual creatures that Job would have bumped into, but they are rather these, these mythic uh, creatures. And, and if you are one of those who then says, well, hey, that's kind of cheap on God's part to, to raise some fantastical beast from the Harry Potter world that, that, that um, Job really can't interact with, then, then let's just back off of the beast and put a couple of other things in their place and in which we are forced to recognize that we, like Job, have no ability to control, much less understand what's going on here. And so in place of, of behemoth, let's put earthquake. Do we understand where earthquakes come from or how they start to do? Uh, do we know how they operate? No. Can we predict them? No. Can we? No. <clears throat> no to everything regarding earthquakes, really. Uh, and for the other one, let's, you know, if we want to have one be land, let's make the other the sea, make it a tsunami. Well, if those end up being too close together, then let's just go much overboard and say that Leviathan is a meteor or a comet getting ready to strike planet Earth. Can you stop it? We don't know. Would you know how to stop it? Well, no. And so we're forced to have to deal with two quasi-imaginary things that are, in fact, very real, that are a part of our creative world. Earthquake and meteor striking the earth. Let's use those in place of behemoth and leviathan. But since the text actually mentions these two, we'll take time to go through behemoth and leviathan as well. So, as I said, this is a hippo or some kind of a mythical monster, a behemoth that is. The, the first speech of God was about the installation of justice in the world. Uh, so now in this second speech, as God continues speaking, it's really about his own power and authority to actually execute that justice in the world. We, ha we, we want to believe that there is justice in the world, and God begins to really make that point in his first speech. Um, and Job has been questioning it regularly, but we don't really see it. Now we find that God is capable of making sure that it actually happens so that we can see it. 
which is what Job's been wanting all along, and that's what's going to end up happening as we work through chapters 40 and 41. Okay, so here's what he says about Behemoth. Um, like Job, Behemoth is a created being. Behemoth is a creature. It is not eternal. It is not divine. It is created. It's strong, it's virile, it's impressive. Um, but despite all of those things, because it is creature and God is creator, God has complete mastery over it. And that's really the key to everything that he says about the kingdom. No matter how big and impressive and mighty it is, it poses no threat to God. God can do with the kingdom whatever God chooses to do with the kingdom. I mean, it's the greatest of the wild animals. It's, it, it's content to stay there in the water and feed on the flora that's in the water and, and do all those things that hippopotamuses, hippopotami do. Uh, it's not afraid of, of the raging, flooding rivers. Uh, it seems to do as it pleases, however it pleases. Um, but God's not afraid of it. God is able to subdue the kingdom any time God needs to. You, Job, uh, subdue Behemoth when you want to. And Job still doesn't say anything. And so God says, all right, all right, I'll continue talking. And so he switches from Behemoth then to Leviathan. Which maybe a crocodile, maybe something else. Uh, we're going to use a, a meteor strike here. If you can't subdue uh, Behemoth, how about Leviathan, who's an even worse creature than, than the uh, Behemoth? Will Leviathan submit very humbly to Job? Will Leviathan do whatever you ask of it? Uh, will it barter its freedom uh, for its life? You know, if you capture it, will it, will it beg for its existence? Uh, will you let your daughters play with Leviathan? Will you put a, a leash on it and let your daughters play with it like a, like a little puppy? Um, will merchants sell pieces of Leviathan in their shops? Uh, can you take on Leviathan? I, God, can take on Leviathan. Can, can you? And God again pauses at the end of verse 11 giving Job an opportunity to respond, and, and Job still doesn't respond. So, so rather than lowering some kind of boom on, on Job, God continues talking even further. I mean, he's already made the point, but he continues pressing the point beginning in, in verse 12. Um, can you stand up to some sort of battle with Leviathan? You know, Leviathan, if it decides to turn on you, very few people can stand up to it. In fact, nobody seems to be able to stand up uh, to it. Uh, God can. Can you, Job? Can you stand? Can you withstand a, an attack? Um, when, when Leviathan is angered and perturbed, it's going to turn on you. You do understand that, right? Um, when, when it runs at people, they tend to scatter uh, because Leviathan can't be stopped or injured by anything that people do to it. Uh, weapons have no effect on it. Weapons just bounce off of Leviathan like pieces of, of rotten wood. Uh, what, have, what have you got that's going to be able to deal with Leviathan? Unlike a dragon, there's no soft underbelly on Leviathan. There's no place for you to be able to stick a black arrow uh, to be able to stop it. Uh, so what are you going to do, Joe? Um, for all intents and purposes, Leviathan is to you an undefeatable beast. Let's be honest, Job. There is nothing that you can do to Leviathan. There's nothing you can do about a Leviathan. So if you can't even stop or deal with the creature, how are you ultimately going to deal with Creator? With me, God. So in short, um, the point that God is making through this second speech is that uh, Job needs to decide if he really wants to continue pressing his claims against God. Are you sure that you really want to do that? Or are you finally ready to concede that you may not be as wise 
things you've thought you knew. True, you've been able to point out some things that you think could be done differently, some things you even you think you might have been able to do better or more appropriately than me, but you don't, do you really understand how it all fits together in, in the big picture? Um, if so, why haven't you implemented the justice that you want in this group? These are all questions that God has put to Job, and it's now time for, for Job uh, to respond. And I'll stop at that point and see if there's anything else you want to, to respond to. That Leviathan. Okay, well then we'll just jump on in to uh, Job's second response. Uh, which is in chapter 42, the first six verses. Um, there are readers of the book of Job who, when they get to these six verses, just throw their hands up and say, well, Job just capitulated. Um, in the end, he capitulated after what we just heard from God. That was the appropriate response. But they're frustrated because they think that God has taken advantage of Job. He's asked all these questions that Job couldn't possibly answer. But that's the point. That's the point. The, the issues that Job has been raising require a, a level and degree and depth of wisdom and authority and justice that Job can't possess. He can't even begin to, to grasp how it all would fit together, much less possess it. In fact, all human creatures put together can't begin to do all of that. Uh, it, there's a huge difference, there's a great divide between creature and creator, and there's a need for us to be able to recognize that. And that's the point that God has been foisting, if you will, upon Job, so that Job has had to finally acknowledge that. Um, but what Job will end up doing in these verses is effectively acknowledging that God has indeed answered all the questions that he was raising in earlier chapters. And you ask, well, how did he do that? Well, what Job really, really wanted, undergirding all of those questions that he had raised, he wanted his friend to respond to it. He wanted his friend, God, to acknowledge that he was there and that he was hurting and that something needed to be done. That God, in his silence, had not been responding. And so Job, beginning to just raise all kinds of imaginary things like we tend to do, had begun to imagine that God was maybe not just after all. That God had, in fact, ceased to be friend and had become enemy to Job. But what Job really wanted was for God just to speak to him, to acknowledge that he knows he's there and that he knows that Job is hurting. And by the time that, that God finishes these speeches at the end of chapter 41, even though he's now put on the spot, Job recognizes and acknowledges that God does know and is willing to accede uh, that, that God really is God. God knows all that's happening on the earth and God is, is just in all of his actions. Uh, so, so Job was willing to finally recant some of those terrible things that he had been saying. Well, that's, that's a way of saying that he has stepped back and said that everything God just said in speech number two is true. God is Lord. And God is above creation. And then he adopts this posture of humility down in verse 3 uh, and acknowledges that he really, well, you know, he had become a little full of himself uh, and had said things that he probably should not have said uh, regarding God. And, well, that's a way of accepting and stating that God's first speech was true. So, so Job has, as he's begun to respond to God, backed off and said, okay, you've answered all my questions. And you have done what I needed. You, you've stated what I needed to hear. And then in verses 4 and 5, he acknowledges that this present encounter that he's just had with God, when God speaks to him in the midst of the worship service, that that far exceeds all previous interactions that he's ever had with God. All those previous interactions with God that, that he has had in this week, 
my suspicion is be true of almost every single one of us, it's on the basis of what the tradition has told us about God. It's, it's based on theologies that we have learned, whether it was in catechesis as a child or things that we've learned in school or those of us who've gone on to seminary or who went to church schools or whatever. We've learned about God, but we've probably, and we've even spoken to God, but we probably haven't heard in, the, in, in those ways that we acknowledge things from God. We haven't had an encounter, so to speak. Uh, and Job says, I have one. And having had that encounter, I do understand things that I didn't understand uh, previously. Um, well, I mean, have you ever had a first-hand encounter with God? Um, and are you willing to acknowledge that you've had one? I've had two, um, and and I've got all I've got enough time to tell you quickly. The first one that I had was was um, I was between my junior and senior years in high school. I mean, I mean, I. Uh, high school, you know, a team um, summer camp out in Colorado, and in a worship service one evening, um, God shows up, and you know, if somebody had looked at me, I'm assuming they would just think I had kind of zoned out for a moment or two, uh, but but God comes to me in the midst of that worship service and tells me what God wants me to do with my life, and it was not what I had planned to be doing with, with my life. Um, but you know, if God comes to you and says, I want you to do this, there's not a whole lot you, I mean, you can argue, I guess, with God, but not a whole lot you can do. God says, you're going to do this, so I said, okay. And so that changed the course of where my life was going to go. I, instead of doing what I was going to do, I I went to a very different school that was close to home that had a strong kind of Bible department and, and, and moved into theology and Bible and ultimately became clergy. But it was all because of this encounter with God in the midst of a worship service at a summer camp in Colorado that was as real to me as, as each of you sitting in front of me. And it went on for quite a while, but then when it was over, you know, my suspicion is that probably about a half a second of real time had, had gone by, but it was a lengthy interaction with God that changed my life greatly. And the second one that was really a first-hand encounter with God was uh, early on, it was my second year of being clergy in the United Methodist Church, and the church that I'm at, we're, we're beginning to really make things are happening in the church, but there's also so much more that could be happening. I mean, that's true of any church, but but we were struggling with figuring out what to do moving forward and how to do things moving forward. And, and in the midst of a dream one night, which I never remember, I can't remember dreams to save my life, but I woke up from this one and went, wait a minute, that was more than just a dream. Uh, and I not only remember every bit of it, but that's beginning to be clear to me that God was telling me something. And to this day, I can remember just, I mean, it's the weirdest thing, but, but it was very clear what God was saying to me, at least it was clear to me. So here I am sitting at a table in church, uh, and lots of people, lots of the congregation uh, is sitting at this table with me too. And, you know, it's kind of like a, uh, a vestry meeting or a church council meeting of some sort. And we're all seated around the table, except somehow or other that table is also a vehicle that's needing to be going down the road. You know, dreams are kind of funky, weird. So this 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 table car isn't going anywhere. We're just sputtering and stopped and not moving, uh, and and we're all not knowing what to do. And and then it became clear that what we needed to do was eat. And so then as we began eating, um, the table got up some speed and, and started skedaddling down the road, uh, moving to where we needed to go. And, and as it did that, it became pretty clear that that table was really an altar table and, and we'd been eating Eucharist together. And, and so that's what we did in the church was, you know, in the United Methodist Church, as a general rule, you don't, have Eucharist every Sunday. Uh, 
Uh, it's still a, kind of a once a month phenomenon in the, um, in the UMC. Well, we became the second church in Tennessee to begin sharing the Eucharist weekly at every single one of our worship services. And that church, even today, with me being gone from it now for 18 years, so for, for the last 33, 34 years, 35 years, that church has been sharing the Eucharist weekly. And, and continues to be a moving force within that conference in some amazing ways. But it was all because of a first-hand vision in which God gave me this wacky thing about a table that was a car sitting down the road after we started eating uh, Eucharist together. Well, that became the focus for what we did. And everything surrounded that meal in that local church. Oh, you know, it might not sound very impressive to you, but boy, it was, it was one of those eye-opening world-changing kinds of things that, that occurred to me. And, you know, maybe that reminds you of something that's happened in your own life where you've had an encounter with God that wasn't necessarily the clearest thing on the front end, but then becomes clear as a little time goes by and you're able to reflect on it. It certainly was for me. So when you get down to verse 6, Job finally recants. Um, he backs off and says... Yeah, okay, I'm willing to admit it. Um, I have become, have become wrong about some of the comments that I have made about you. Uh, and so I, I say enough is enough with that. And, and won't press my case any further. Well, you've probably run into lots of people and maybe made the comments yourself that, um, you know, when I get to heaven, I have every intention of asking God about <laughs> filling the blank. Well, when Job finally has the chance to be face-to-face -face with God, yeah, who cares about the questions? Um, he's just there to worship. And my suspicion, of course, is that that's going to be exactly the case with us as well. We're not going to care about those questions, whether they are the ones we had as children about, well, where did, how did dinosaurs fit in? Or what happens to such and such? Or, or the adult versions of it, where we think God should be doing such and such. Um, so I'm going to ask, well, we're not going to care. That's not going to matter. The important thing is that we're going to be there uh, with God. God is going to be there with us, as the book of Revelation puts it. Uh, and that's all that's ultimately going to matter. And that's finally all that matters to Job. When all is said and done, when you get to the end of verse 6, God has made it clear that God knows what is happening in Job's life. And Job once again knows that his friend is responding. All the other details no longer matter. Whether I'm hurting, whether I'm healthy, whether whatever, whatever, it no longer matters. God knows where I am and God knows all about me. And if that's the case, I'm okay with it, says Job. So, um, one of the things that we, that James and I have both done as we've worked our way through this study is that, is that we've taken what often are strange words that we may find difficult as we're reading along to, to understand what they mean um, and how they fit and how we're supposed to respond to them and, and tried to simplify them in a way that you can begin to, we can all begin to sort of comprehend and make sense of, of the book of Job. And that has reminded us that, that since all of us are old enough to have remembered whether we actually watched it or not, um, Sanford and Son, do you remember that, that show? Um, and do you remember the two cops, the one white honky and, and the one um, cool cat black guy, Officers Hopkins and, and Smith, who would show up and see Fred and, and his son, Lamont, uh, do you remember how they would respond to them? <laughs> Officer um, Hopkins would show up and he would, you know, articulating observation right, and blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And Fred and Lamont would look at him like, what did he say? And then look over at that Officer Smith and Smith would say something, you know, in Ebonics. Right. <laughs> he said, blah, blah, blah. Well, so we have a, a very, very short skit. <laughs> that, will, that will walk you through chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. Okay, so 
open up your books to chapter 42, 1 through 6, and, and we will do the Officer Hopkins and Officer Smith oh, version of <laughs> chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. Now I'm going to take the role of Joe, um, which is going to also be Officer Hopkins. I'm going to be the, the dumb white hunk, and he's going to be the, the cool cat who, who makes sense of what I just got through saying. Okay? And I just got this. We, I should probably say that. I never know when I come in. We, we never know what the other's going to say. So. so then Job replied to the Lord. Said Job. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Wow. That's amazing, God. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. I had no idea how involved you are in our world. You said, listen now, I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. You told me to trust you. <laughs> my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. I get it now. <laughs> Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. I do trust you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I hope that you can see that that's what we've been doing really for the last 10 weeks, is taking those words that in themselves are not strange to us, and we're no words we didn't understand, but, but the way they're said and the way they are put together, it's hard to really grasp the point that's being made. And so what we've tried to do is, is be the cool cats who come in and make sense of what uh, Officer Hopkins has been saying. Anything more you want to say at this point? Well, I'll just say very quickly, I, I, just to build on what he was saying, I think really just the apprehension versus comprehension. It used to, it would drive me nuts to not be able to, because uh, I wanted to comprehend everything. And it finally just became much of a, a, of a relief just to say, you know, I can apprehend it, but I can't comprehend it. And uh, uh, Brandon, that was a good example, where he had said that, uh, I forgot where he was at, but he said that he had, uh, there was a sign that said at Eucharist, you'll never be closer uh, to God than during Eucharist here on earth. So that's a perfect example. I can completely apprehend the Eucharist, the real presence. You know, again, going not transubstantiation, memorial, real presence, but I can't comprehend it. If someone says the Trinity, well, I can apprehend that. I can read Scripture, and it makes perfect sense. Well, break it down to no, I can't comprehend it. All the stuff Job's been going through, I can apprehend. It. I can't comprehend it, and I think just to add to that that last bit, I think that's uh, really kind of what it comes down to, to where, you know, exactly how Vaughn said it, to where basically Job is, nope, that's good enough, I'm good. <laughs> no point taking it any further, and uh, yeah, so I think that's all I would add. I'm done, we're good here. <laughs> All right, that's chapter 10. We'll come back next week for uh, the final few verses in the book of Job and see what happens as a result of Job's recantation. Appreciate you being here tonight. <laughs> <laughs>